We are in Jeremiah chapter 1, and my message this morning is entitled, Who Are You? You know, one of the interesting and, and common themes of the Gospels is identity. It's a significant theme. It's all the way through the Gospels, particularly in the life of Jesus, because people didn't know who he was. I mean, this issue of Jesus' identity, right from the beginning of the Gospels to the end, it was one big question mark. His own brothers and sisters didn't know who he was. And think about it. What would it take for your brother to convince you that he was the Messiah? Right? Would you believe him? Even his own cousin, do you remember John the Baptist? He said this. He said, are you the one? Or do we look for another? People were unsure about Jesus' identity. And then right to the very end of Jesus' life, actually at his trial, the high priest said, are you the Christ? And he did not answer. And he asked them a second time. He said, are you the Christ? And this time he said, I am who you say. And he revealed his identity at the end. And he was very careful about guarding his identity because he didn't want to cut short his ministry if he got it out too quickly. I think that was the reasoning behind that. But here's what I don't want you to miss. Here's the most important part of what I'm saying today. Is that even though nobody else knew who Jesus was, Jesus knew who he was. And see, what we're going to learn today is it doesn't matter who other people think you are. What's important is that you know who you are. I'm going to tell you a completely true story. You're going to doubt it. And that's why I'm telling you at the beginning. It's a true story that happened to me. And uh, we had this, this lady in our neighborhood. And she went out for a bike ride every day. And she had one of those old, like, Schwinn bikes. You know, those big old bikes. And she went by our house at, like, a mile an hour. Every single day she went by. And I would look out the window and I'd see her. One day I was out raking the grass, or raking the leaves. And she came by at a mile an hour. And she stopped. And she said hello, and we started talking. And I wasn't 100% sure who she was, even though I'd seen her every day. And I thought she was the lady that lived at the corner, Mrs. Spears. So I said this to her. I said, you're Spears, aren't you? And she said, no, I'm Mark Hughes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. And I went, what? And she said, I'm Mark Hughes. And I went, no. I'm Mark Hughes. <laughs> like, I'm having this really weird Twilight Zone moment, you know? <laughs> da -da 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 -da. You have just entered the Twilight Zone. I have this woman telling me that she's Mark Hughes. And so I said, no, I'm Mark Hughes. And she says, no, you're Mark Hughes. I'm Mark Hughes. Dolores Mark Hughes. <laughs> that was her name. <laughs> It was such a strange moment not knowing who I was for that brief second <laughs> because somebody told me that they were me. And, you know, this thing of identity, if, if you think about it, it's something we struggle with all through our life. There's this immense story from the First World War that happened in France in particular. In, this, in the First World War, uh, there was tremendously psychologically damaged people. They, they called it the war to what? and all wars. And the reason I called it that was because they were in face-to-face -face trench warfare. They saw the horrors of war face-to-face, -face, up close, like probably like no other war. And that's why they called it the war to end all war. And there was a lot of people that today we would call it you know, PTSD and post-traumatic stress disorder. But in those days, it was, they called it shell shock. And the, the French army wasn't great at keeping records. And they had 100 people or 100 plus soldiers that they didn't know who they were. They had lost track of who these people were. And here's the other part. They were shell shocked and had amnesia. And they didn't know who they were. And so what were they going to do with this hundred some men, soldiers, after the war that they didn't know who they were and they didn't know who they were themselves and they had to figure out what to do with them. So they decided to have an identification rally in Paris and they advertised it and they said that there was these men and they didn't know who they were and if, and if you, you were missing someone in, in wartime, they didn't come home after the war, to gather in Paris and they were going to reveal these men and people could claim these men who were healthy of body, but just were lost in, the, in their identity and didn't know who they were. And so thousands of people showed up hoping that their son or their husband was one of these men that was suffering from amnesia. And there was these thousands of people in the, in the city square of, of Paris, and they erected a platform. And one by one, these poor men went up and took the microphone and said, please, can someone tell me who I am? 
and there would be a rustling in the crowd as a family would identify that man and they would make their way through the crowd and they would go up and there was these hugs and this, these poor hapless men would stand there not knowing who they are being claimed by these what seemed like strangers and most of them got claimed by a family. And I'm just wondering if you can imagine that picture for a moment, these people being claimed by the family. They didn't know who they were. There was a war reporter that had uh, covered the whole war. And he said in the entire war, he had not seen such high drama and intense emotion as that moment of those families being re reunited with these people who didn't know who they were. Now, in a way, every one of us does the same thing trying to figure out we, who we are from the moment we emerge from the womb. Think about it. You get claimed. You come out of the womb, and you get claimed by a family of strangers. They're trying to kiss you and hug you and hold you, and you don't know who these people are. Who are you people? And we spend the rest of our life trying to figure out who we are. And we ask these, these ubiquitous questions, these universal questions, which is this. Who are you, and why are you here? Isn't that the question that everybody asks? But here's the thing that I don't want you to miss, is that the tragedy is too many people spend their entire life having other people tell them who they are instead of knowing who they are. And we often listen to the voices of others more than we ought and not recognize who we are. I, I think if we're honest, and you don't have to answer this in any way, but if we're honest, I think most of us struggle with our identity. I think most of us struggle with that question. Who am I? Who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? Why am I on, on planet Earth? Unless you're Popeye the sailor. How many remember Popeye the sailor? He knew who he was. I am that I am. That's all that I am. <laughs> what, do you find my pronunciation funny? <laughs> I love Popeye. Popeye rocks, right? But most of us, we struggle with who we are. And we're constantly listening to these voices out there that tell us who we are, which may or may not be the case. I know everybody in this room would know who the actor Billy Crystal is. He was in an airport coffee shop. He had been traveling. He was blurry-eyed. He was sitting there drinking coffee. And this woman came up to him and said, has anyone ever told you you look a lot like Billy Crystal? To which he said, oh, people tell me all the time. And then she said, you're not Billy Crystal, are you? And he said, no. And she said, well, too bad you didn't get his money instead of just his looks. <laughs> And so, you know, people are always telling us who we are and who we should be. Speaking of Billy, Billy is five years old, and one day his mother takes this red towel, wraps it around his neck, and calls it a cape, and says, you're Superman. And of course, Billy was excited about it and started running around the house, I'm Superman, I'm Superman. For the next six months, every morning, he put on the red towel, and he ran around the house saying, I'm Superman, I'm Superman. Well, eventually he had to go to school. He went to grade one. Guess what he did? He put on the red towel and went to school. And when the teacher was doing roll call and asked him who he was, he said, I'm Superman. And she says, all right, that's cute and everything, but, but who are you? I need to know. He said, I'm, I'm Superman. And so she says, I'm going to ask you one more time. And if you don't tell me who you really are, I'm going to send you to the principal's office. So she asked him one more time. He said, I'm Superman. So she sent him down to the principal's office. This poor five-year-old kid is sitting in the principal's office. And he at least was more fatherly about it. And he said, OK, son. We really need to know your true identity. We need to know who you are, because we have to keep records of the students. And, and so just can you do me a favor and tell me your real name? Billy turned to the left, turned to the right, and said, my real name is Clark Kent. Yeah. <laughs> Surely you saw that coming, didn't you? Yeah, you must have. All right, so we're in, we're in Jeremiah, and we're in Jeremiah chapter 1. And uh, we're going to read this little story all about identity and all about the identity of a young man named Jeremiah. And we're going to talk about how it relates to you, which it does. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. And I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, oh, Lord, God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am a youth, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. So we know uh, historians or theologians are telling us that, that Jeremiah was probably about 17 years old, uh, based on the chronology of, of when this first happened. Here's this young kid, and, and God shows up, and God tells him who he is. 
And uh, he doesn't know what 17-year-old really knows who they are, what they're going to do, but God does that. And uh, he gave him a life that probably nobody in this room would really want. He became the prophet to the nations, in fact, mostly to, to Israel. And he prophesied for 40 years to Israel, and basically he told them for 40 years to repent. And he told them to repent because he said, if you don't repent, God's going to send judgment on the nation. He's going to send the king from the east, the Nebuchadnezzar, and they're going to, they're going to take and bring you into captivity for 70 years. And so for 40 years, he prophesied this. And how'd that go for him? Not very well. They didn't listen to him. They, they ostracized him. They persecuted him. They harassed him. At one point, they took him and they lowered him on ropes into the bottom of a well that was you know, half dried up. And he sunk into the muck up to his neck. And they were going to leave him there to starve to death. And there was a man by the name of Ebed Melech. He was a Cushite. He wasn't even a Jew. He said, you can't treat your people like that. And he went and he pulled them out of the well. So they said, fine, we won't kill him. We'll imprison him. And they threw him into prison. Now then what happened is exactly what Jeremiah prophesied would happen, happened. And King Nebuchadnezzar came and the Babylonian Empire conquered Jerusalem and conquered Israel and put all the people in captive. And then they had to decide, what are we going to do with this guy that's in jail? This is the guy that's been saying king that you've been coming. He said, you know, him I like. <laughs> I don't like the rest of them. Him I like. Let's get him out of prison and let's get him a nice house and do him no harm. And so Jeremiah ends up, the rest of them are in captivity. He ends up living in a nice house, swimming pool, the whole thing. And, uh, and it's sort of a crazy story because when, when, when everybody else was free, he was a captive. And when everybody else was captive, he was free. And one of the things you discover is that when you do the will of God, you often find yourself swimming upstream against what everybody else is doing. But the most important part of all of this is that, that Jeremiah was faithful to who he was and what he was called to do. And there, there's a few things, that, if you read this story, there's a few things that he learned. He, he, learned, he learned this. He learned that God knew him. He knew that God had called him. And he knew that God had equipped him. And we're going to talk about, in the next couple of weeks, it's going to take me a couple of weeks to do this, we're going to talk about how God knows you, and he calls you, and he equips you. But today we're going to deal mostly with the fact that he knows you. And my question in the immortal words of Peter Townsend of The Who is, who are you? I really got to know who, who are you? And we're going to look at that question today, and we're going to try to determine that even though these words were for Jeremiah, they were specifically for Jeremiah, they all apply to you. And as we're going through this, I want you to apply it to yourself and your own existence. And let's look at this verse again, and I'm going to ask you some questions. This is the interactive part. We're going to look at this. He says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. First question is this, who formed you? Who? God formed you. It wasn't your mama, it wasn't your papa, it wasn't your mama and papa together. He says, before I formed you in the womb. So you were formed in the womb, we're going to look at that. Second question is, how long has he known you? It says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. You know, we talk about life beginning at conception, and I think that's true. But God says he knew you even before that happened. He said, I've known you when? Someone said forever. He said, from before the foundation of the world is how long he has known you. You have always been in the heart of God before the world even existed. He knew who you were. He knew you were coming. And so we're going to talk about that, how long God's known you. The third question is this that we're going to look at. And how long has God had a purpose for your life? It tells us right here, before you were born, I sanctified you, and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Before, that was, that was Jeremiah's call, but you have a call, you have a purpose, you have a destiny. How long has he known about it? Before you were born. So we're going to look at the fact that God, God formed you, God knows you, and God has a purpose for your life. So let's, let's start about this with this first question as to who formed you? Who was it that, that, that made you? So a lot of times we get confused about who we are. And we say, well, you know, I know what I am. I'm a genetic mixture of my dad and my mom. I got my mom's eyes, my dad's nose. And, you know, we go on like this. And uh, we forget that, that we are far more than that. You see, God formed you, not man. God created you in the, in the womb. And he formed you just the way he wanted you to be. The scripture says that you were created in the image of God. He created man in the image of God, male and female. He created them. The scripture says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Whoever you are, however you're made, God made you the way you are. You know, we had, there was a couple months ago, I noticed this kid, he was a little snotty-nosed kid, and he's running around here, and he had this T-shirt on, and, and the T-shirt said, I know I'm somebody, because God don't make no junk. 
right? <laughs> and uh, there's a picture up there. I know I'm somebody because God don't make no junk. And you know what? That's true. Every single one of you are created and formed exactly the way God wants you to be. But let's be honest. Can we be honest here for a minute? How many of you are perfectly 100% happy with every aspect of how God made you? Anybody? Why are there no hands? Every single one of us, if we think about this, every single one of us thinks that maybe God made a few little mistakes along the way. Why did he give me these ears? You know, why did he give me this nose? Why did he give me this personality? Why did he give me this brain that doesn't work like everybody else's? Why didn't he give me, you know, an ability to speak better? And we all have something about ourselves that we're not happy with. And we think that somehow God made some flaws and that we have some imperfections. But the scripture doesn't say that. The scripture says you are made exactly the way he wanted to make you because he formed you in the womb. And you are fearfully and you are wonderfully made. Now, let me tell you a remarkable story about this. We had a gal in the church. She was about 20 years old. And she had this birthmark on her cheek. She'd had her whole life. And her parents were, I think, wise people. Because when she was born with this birthmark, and it was like an inch and a half long and an inch wide, it was a pretty significant mark on her face. And when she was born, her parents, she started asking about it because she noticed other kids didn't have it. And so they said, that's who you are. God made you unique, and God made you special, and he gave you that. So she was always comfortable with the mark that, on her face because her parents told her that's the way God made her and that she was unique, and that was part of her uniqueness. So she was always comfortable with it. When she was 20 years old when I met her, she, uh, had, the doctors had said, we have to remove that from your face because you're at risk of malignancy with that, and we have to remove that. And what we want to do is we want to remove that mark, and what we want to do is we want to take a skin graft from your thigh, and we're going to put it on your face, and when we're done, you're not going to see that it was ever even there. And she said, I don't want you to do that. And they said, well, what do you, what do you mean? And she says, you can take it off, but I want you to leave the scar, because she says, that's who I am. And she says, that mark is who I am. And if you take away the mark, then I won't feel like I am who I am. And she says, I'm not comfortable with you covering up with who I am and the way God has made me. And so they did the procedure, and they took it off, and they left a scar. And to tell you the truth, it didn't look much different after the surgery than it did before, except now that it was, it was, it was not exposed. And I thought, what a remarkable thing for a young 20-year-old woman to be comfortable with who they are. And if you're honest, most of you would look into the mirror every single day and you would detest that rather than what she did. She was comfortable with who she was. She said, that's how God's made me. He's made me unique. And you know, if you don't think that this is true, what I'm saying about how we are struggle with this, then explain the $425 billion a year worldwide cosmetic industry. We're spending $425 billion every year covering up something, something we don't like, right? Think about this. You know, I mean, I'm on television. I know this. We've got these lights blaring in me. You know, for years I've been wearing makeup on Sunday morning. You know why? I'd cover the wrinkles. Not working anymore. You know what I'm using now? Body filler. <laughs> Go to Canadian Tire, get Bondo, I fill the cracks. <laughs> How's it work for me? <laughs> Not very well. <laughs> But why is it we're not comfortable with who God's made us to be? He formed you in the womb, it says. Not mama, not papa. It's not some gen genetic mistake or mutation or fluke or whatever. He has chosen you to be exactly how he's chosen you, and that was his decision, nobody else's. You know, in 1982, Robert Schuller, you all know him from the Crystal Cathedral, he wrote a book called Self-Esteem, The New Reformation. Now, you know... Schuller's always been kind of the light-duty preacher at best, right? Never really into the deep theological things. He kind of ministered to people on the surface where people live. And so he writes this book about self-esteem. And in his book, catch this, he says that, the, that man's greatest problem is low self-esteem. Now, just think about it for a moment. How do you think the conservative theologians responded to that statement? that the biggest problem that mankind faces is low self-esteem. Well, they absolutely creamed him because everybody knows and everybody in this room that the biggest problem face of mankind is what? Sin. You all knew it, or at least you didn't say it, but you knew it. It's sin. And you know what? I think even Schuller knew that, but I don't think that was his point. And if you read his book, it's interesting what he says about it. He talks about the fall. He talks about sin. And what he was actually talking about was the consequence of sin because he talked about when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, the first thing they knew, the first thing, was that they were naked and they were ashamed. 
He said the first consequence of sin was low self-esteem, right? A, sh a shame of who they were. They were naked and ashamed, and all of a sudden they looked at themselves and they weren't happy with themselves. And, you know, of course, you know, sin is the bigger problem, but, you know, there's some truth in what he said. There's this issue of self-esteem. And as I began to think about this, I realized I don't know a single person from great or small, I don't care who they are, I don't know anybody that doesn't have some level that they struggle with self-esteem. Am I right about that? I don't think there's anybody. I don't care who, who you've met, who you know, or who you think you are. And a lot of times, the people who seem to be the most confident on the outside are sometimes the most insecure on the inside. You know what I'm talking about. Those people are always, you know, building themselves up and talking about how wonderful they are and all these things, and they're going on and on. And the first thing you think, has that guy got an esteem problem? How many of you know someone like that, that, that they see so confident on the outside that you're sure that they're insecure on the inside? How many of you know somebody like that? How many are somebody like that? <laughs> wow. <laughs> At least a few of you are willing to admit that. I was thinking about this whole conf confidence thing and self-esteem thing. And I was thinking of this story of Nebuchadnezzar that I mentioned earlier. Nebuchadnezzar was this, this king. He comes in. He, he's, he's overseen the kingdom of Babylon. He was the single most powerful man in the entire world. Babylon was the greatest empire that the world had ever known. The city of Babylon was the most significant city that had ever been built. The wa walls were so wide they could have chariot races around the tops of them. The Babylonian hanging gardens were considered one of the wonders of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And so then we have this, this moment, you've all read it in Daniel chapter 4. We have this moment where King Nebuchadnezzar erects a statue to whom? To himself, 90 feet tall, a statue to himself. And he says, now this is what we're going to do. At the sound of the music, we're all going to bow down and worship the statue of me. And so if that wouldn't be too much trouble, if you'd all do that, that would be swell. I'm thinking, what is wrong with this guy? He doesn't have enough going on that he's the most powerful man in the whole world, that now he's requiring every human being in his realm to bow down at the stupid statue to himself? I'm thinking... Really? You can't think of anything else to do? And so the music plays, everybody, thousands, probably tens of thousands of people, bow down to the statue except three men. Do you remember these three guys? What were their names? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They would not bow down, and Nebuchadnezzar takes a fit. I'm thinking, who cares? Three guys off with their heads. Done. Problem solved. No, he marches down there. You're not going to bow down to me, the statue. And he starts like freaking out and says, I'm going to give you a second chance. I'm going to give you one more chance. And if you don't bow down, we're going to heat the furnace seven times hotter and throw you. I think, seriously, you have nothing better to do? You could give a rip about what these three, three Jewish men, whether they bow down or not. I mean, talk about obsessive behavior. And he heats the furnace, and they don't bow down, and he throws them in. You know the rest of the story. But I'm thinking, what is wrong with this guy? What is going on in that little brain of his? He's the most powerful man in the world, and he's still wrestling with his own sense of insecurity. You know what the historian and philosopher Bertrand Russell said? He said, the megalomaniac, like the Nebuchadnezzar type, the megalomaniac differs from the narcissist in that he seeks to be powerful rather than charming. He seeks to be feared rather than loved. And then he says, many are the lunatics of history and most of the great men. And he says that really these people, these great people that we've seen in history, most of them are beyond self-centered. They're these megalomaniacs that need everybody fearing and worshiping them and need this ultimate sense of power. And I started thinking about the great, the so-called great people, the actors and politicians and all these people. And why are they so full of themselves? And why do they need constant accolades? Why do they need constant affirmation for who? Why are they so insecure? So the other day, you, you know I'm a big fan of Donald Trump. You probably know that, right? And uh, I, I realize it's sort of some sort of per, per, it, I, I found a picture of him. It's the best picture I could find. And I, I have this sort of perverse curiosity about Donald Trump. I don't know what it is. And uh, I, he was given a speech the other day. I don't know if any of you caught it. it was, I watched the whole speech from beginning to end because he fascinates me. I, and what he did was he alluded 
that he might run for the US presidency in 2016. I hope he does. For the sake of all late night comedians, I hope he does. <laughs> And so he, may, he, he alludes, and, and in this speech, I watched the whole thing, he told us why he would make the best president. You know why? Because he's amazing. That's what he told us. He said he was immensely successful, and he had made a ton of money, and he made a lot of money, and he's very successful. And again and again and again in the speech, he told us that he should be the president because he's a winner. And what America needs is a winner. And again and again, he said, because I'm a winner. You know, here's my, my thought on this. Someone who has to continually tell other people that they are a winner, I have a name for them. You know what I call them? A loser. I call them a loser. If you have to continually tell people you're a winner, you're probably a loser. Right? There's probably some deep-seated root of insecurity that has just captivated you. Now, before I sort of you know, go off and sound too self-righteous, I realize that I suffer with this absolute same element, <laughs> the same as the rest of you. I do. And it was revealed to me a couple of weeks ago in such a profound way that I was very disappointed with myself. I'm embarrassed to tell you this story. I'm going to tell it anyway, because inquiring minds want to know. So, so we were on our study break, like I said, and by happenstance, I ended up meeting this man. It was just sort of a coincidence. I met this man, and he turned out he was the pastor of the Presbyterian Church right down the street from where we were staying. And so he told me he was the pastor of that church. And, and so, of course, if someone tells me that they're a pastor, guess what I'm going to tell them? I'm going to tell them I'm a pastor. So, oh, yeah, I'm a pastor, too. And so we talked about that and had that in common. And so then at the end of our conversation, I said to him, well, maybe we'll come on Sunday and, and hear you preach. And so that was fine. And then he started pitching me. And he said, well, you know, we do a men's Bible study on Monday night. And he said, you know, I'm taking the men through the book of Mark. And uh, maybe you'd like to join us. I think you'd really enjoy the study I'm doing with the men. And all of a sudden, I had this twinge of insecurity. And I had this sense of identity crisis. And I didn't say it, but I'll tell you what I was thinking. And what was going through my mind was, do you have any idea who I am? <laughs> this is what was going through my mind. Do you know who I am? <laughs> You're inviting me to listen to your Bible study on the book of Mark? I am Mark. <laughs> I am Mark Hughes. <laughs> and I didn't say it, but I was so discouraged with myself disappointed with myself that I even thought of it. I thought, how come I still have this root of insecurity at this stage of the game? I wanted to. I'll tell you what I wanted to do. I wanted, you want to talk about your church? Let me tell you about my church. I wanted to go on and tell them what I did and who I was and what I'd accomplished. And I managed to restrain myself, but I still had that root inside of me. I still had that sense, that twinge of, of insecurity and the fact that I couldn't stand my anonymity. The fact that I was anonymous, I wanted to tell him who I was. But you know what? It's worse than that. Because you know why it's worse? Because I wanted to tell him what I did, not who I was. You see, I realized I get my identity from what I do, not who I am. You see, there's something wrong with that. Because we are who we are and who God's made us to be, and who we are is far more important than what we do. And if, and if we get caught up in what we do, what happens when you stop doing what you're doing? Are you no longer you? And see, we have to have our, our identity rooted in who we are and who God has made us to be. And why can't we be comfortable with who God's made us to be? Imperfections, warts and all. That's the message that we need to get this morning. There's a story of this, this woman, her husband goes missing. He's gone for a whole day. She goes to her next door neighbor, and she says, my husband hasn't come home. I'm worried. She says, well, we've got to go to the police. So they go to the police, and the officer says, give me a description of your husband. And so the woman said, well, he's tall, dark, handsome, soft-spoken, and kind. And the neighbor says, what are you talking about? Your husband is short, bald, mean, and angry. And she said, yeah, but who'd want him back? <laughs> <laughs> My apologies to any of you that resemble the latter better than the former. But the first thing, the first question here is, is who formed you? God formed you. And the second question is, is how long has he known you? How long has God known you? And the answer is here. He says that before you were born, before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. 
And, and he created you from the very, very beginning. And here's the thing I don't want you to miss. There are no accidents. You know how sometimes people say, well, you know, our daughter, she was a mistake. There is no mistakes. How could there be a mistake? If God knew them before they were formed in the womb, how could there be a mistake? There is no such thing as a mistake. Even a teenage pregnancy, even a product of a rape, even a birth control that didn't quite work still means that whoever that person comes into this world, they were known by God from the foundation of the earth, and there is no mistakes. You know, my family, I come from a Catholic family, and some of my family are what I would call very Catholic. We have Catholics and very Catholics. And the very Catholics, they, they only do the natural birth control. There's another uh, term for natural birth control. It's called a large family. And, uh, <laughs> and so I, I don't know how many, of you, how many of you would recognize this, but one of the natural forms of birth control is something called Serena. Anybody familiar with the Serena form of, of, of birth control? Not very many of you. It's this super thermal thing. It has a lot to do with uh, thermo thermometers and stuff. And anyway, you don't want to hear about it. And, uh, and so they, they were always, they used the Serena method of birth control. So after the birth of their 10th child, <laughs> this is no joke, this is true. After the birth of their 10th child, they seriously considered calling her Serena. <laughs> they didn't, but they should have. <laughs> and I want you to think about this for a minute and, and excuse the crassness in the biology lesson, but here it goes. Your mother in her lifetime produced 450 viable eggs, 450 eggs. You're one of them. Your father in his lifetime, wait for it, produced 525 billion sperm. <laughs> Your dad was very prolific. <laughs> and somehow, one of those 525 billion sperm found that one of those 450 eggs, and that became you. You know what the chances of you existing are? infinitesimal, almost zero. You shouldn't exist, but you do. Why? Because God knew you before the foundation of the world, and he chose you. There are no accidents. There are no accidents. You are not some sort of fluke or freak of nature. You're not just some sort of genetic experiment of, of two people coming together. God knew in his sovereignty, in his omnipotence, he knew that somehow one of those 525 billion sperm would join with one of those 450 eggs, the permutations of which we can't even imagine, and that person became you. You should be excited right going and going, I'm special, <laughs> because you are special, trust me. You know, and when you look at this, when you look at his, even Jesus, you look at Jesus for a moment, and we know Jesus at times revealed his, his identity. Do you remember? He, sa he said to, to Peter, or actually said to the disciples, he said, who do men say I, the son of man, am? And the disciples spoke up, and they said, well, some say Jeremiah or Elias or one of the prophets. And Peter spoke up and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus went, Giddy up. You got it. Uh, blessed are you, Simon Barjoni. You nailed that one. And he was excited. And they, they figured out who Jesus was. So here was Jesus. I want you to think about Jesus for a moment. Here was Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords, the creator of the heaven and earth, who came to live in the world amongst us, the incarnate Son. But I want you to think about who Jesus was, because Jesus was a descendant of all those messed up people in the Old Testament. You go read those stories, one disaster after another, and those people were Jesus' descendants. You will remember Manasseh. Manasseh was the single worst king that Israel ever had. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He was so bad that his own servants killed him. Jesus is a direct descendant of King Manasseh. Jesus is a direct descendant of Rahab the harlot. Not only was she a prostitute, she was a Gentile prostitute. Do you remember? She was the harlot who lived on the city wall of Jericho, and they were supposed to come in and destroy that city and destroy everybody who was in it. But the harlot, Rahab, helped them, and she ended up marrying a Jewish man and is in the direct line of Jesus. Jesus is a descendant of a Gentile harlot. And we look at Jesus, and Jesus is a direct descendant of King Solomon. And you go, well... So what? Big deal. He should be. Yeah, think about that for a moment. Who was, who was King Solomon's mom? Anybody remember? That was Bathsheba. It was Bathsheba. 
And Solomon was, as a result of an adulterous affair between King David and another man's wife, and he took her in an illicit manner, took her as his own wife, and the product of that was King Solomon. And Jesus is the product and the direct descendant of an adulterous affair. When you begin to put things in this perspective, you begin to realize there are no mistakes in God's plan. God has taken it all, the mistakes and the imperfections and the, the sin and the error and even the evil things that our families have done, and he weaves it into his plan. And he says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. There are no mistakes. There are no accidents. You know, one day my youngest daughter asked me this. She was younger. I was talking about, actually, Kathy's old boyfriends. And... Um, in the conversation, in the conversation, my daughter said, if mom had married one of them instead of you, would I be somebody else? <laughs> to which I confused her a little further and said, no, I would be somebody else. <laughs> and that's more true than you know, right? There's this story of this husband and wife, they're cruising along in their BMW convertible. He is a CIO, CEO of this big company. They stop for gas, and while they're getting gas, she's chatting up the gas jockey. After they pull out of the gas station, he turns to her and says, what was that all about? And she sort of enthusiastic says, I used to date him in high school. The CEO starts to chuckle and goes, well, imagine that. If you'd married him, you'd be married to a gas jockey. She says, no. If I'd married him, he'd be the CEO, and you'd be the gas jockey. <laughs> So the first question is, is, you know, who formed you? God formed you. The second question was, how long has he known you from, from the foundation of the earth before you were formed in the womb? And the last and the final question is this, is how long has he had a purpose for your life? And our verse, if you go back to it, says, before you were born, I sanctified you and ordained you. God has had a purpose for your life from the, for the, from the beginning of time. He knew what you were going to do. The challenge is, we don't know what we're going to do. But we're going to talk about this next time, about your purpose in life. But here's the one thing I want to say in conclusion this morning. It's this. What you do comes out of who you are. Your purpose is, is only subsequent to your identity. Discovering who you are is more important. And if you look through scripture, every single person, before God told them what they were going to do, he told them who they were. He told Jesus who he was before he told him what to do. He told Jeremiah who he was before he told him what to do. He told Gideon. He told Joshua. And we'll look at some of those next time. He, looked, he told them who they were before he told them what they were going to do. And we need to wrestle with and find and discover who we are. Instead of listening to other people tell us who we are, we need to begin to look at the scripture, who it says we are. And I'll tell you who it says we are. It says that if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. If you are not proud of your heritage and your pedigree, i got good news for you. you got a new pedigree. You have become part of a new family. And it doesn't matter what side of the tracks you were born on and what, how much money you've made, what kind of education. None of that matters because you are children of the living God. That is who you are. Let me close with one final story here today. Some of you would recognize the name Brian Pallister. Brian is the leader of the provincial PC uh, party, and he's been a politician for many years. I've known him for, for decades, actually, and, and uh, I listened to a speech probably about 10 years ago that he was giving, and in this speech, he was talking about one of his daughters. He has two daughters, and uh, when he became a politician, his daughter was so proud of her father that she always introduced herself as Brian Pallister's daughter. And so whenever someone would say, who are you? And she'd say, I'm Brian Pallister's daughter. And finally, her mother, Esther, came up to her one day and said, honey, you got to quit introducing yourself as Brian Pallister's daughter. You are not Brian Pallister's daughter. You are your own woman. You are your own person. And you need to be com comfortable with who you are. And so she said, all right, I understand. Two days later, they're at church. This woman comes up to her and says, you're Brian Pallister's little girl, aren't you? She said, I thought I was, but my mother says I'm not. <laughs> she didn't quite get it. And see, here's what I want you to know today, is that you are part of the family of God. 
You are, you are brothers and sisters in the family of God. We have a father in heaven. Regardless of what journey we've taken in life, you have a new pedigree. You have a new father. And he said, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. And if God be for you, who can be against? Let's stand together, shall we? I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment here today, if you would. Because I know there are people in this room that have not yet made that decision to be a follower of Christ. You have not joined the family of God. He created you. You're unique. He's, he's exactly the way he wants you to be. But he wants you to join the rest of the family. I'm not asking you, have you been to church, have been baptized as an infant? I'm asking you this. Have you had a definitive moment where you've invited Christ into your life? to live there and reign there and let his characteristics begin to move out in your life. And if you haven't quite made that decision and you'd like to do that today, I'm going to give you a chance. I'm not going to call you forward. I'm not going to single you out. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. won't have to say anything publicly. But with every head bowed, every eye closed, if that's you and you would like to make that decision to join the family of God and to become a son of the Most High God, I just want you to raise your hand right where you are. I won't call you forward. Right where you are, just take a moment, raise your hand, let me see it, thank you on the side, thank you in the back. Anybody else want to join these folks? Just take a moment, I'm not going to call you forward, but you do need to make a decision. All right, okay. All right, you can all put down your hands, I didn't see them all, but it doesn't matter, God did. And uh, we're all going to say this prayer together, and pray it especially if you raised your hand. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. I thank you for the work of the cross that you came and you died for me. And on the third day you rose again and you forever live to give me life. I thank you for who I am. You have made me just the way you want me. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am a son of the living God and I am comfortable with who I am and I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give Jesus a hand today, shall we?